Thank you, Ware. Um, as you gathered from that little list of books, I do an awful lot of stuff with war. <laughs> I, um, not a junkie, but it has been a topic that, you know, as a journalist, I've followed a great deal and for a long time. Um, rather than having devoted my adult life to worrying about the climate, so why did I suddenly end up writing about matters climatic? And the answer is that about three years ago, I was in Washington, as I am several times a year. I mean, you have to go there to figure out what they're up to once in a while if you're a journalist. Um, and uh, I, I heard on the grapevine, so to speak, that the Pentagon was getting interested in climate change. No clear reason why, but it was. And so I you know, you asked a couple of friends who had connections in the intelligence community, who might I talk to about this? And they dropped a few names. And I talked to those people, obviously, off the record. But yes, they confirmed. Um, in the back room, so to speak, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is this is not a joke, the brains of the army. Um, in the back room, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were actually studying what roles the US military would have in a warming world. Now, this was the time of the Bush administration still, so they weren't doing it in the front room. Um, what they were actually doing, and the evidence began to surface about 2008, was having done their own studies, um, they were then getting more than friendly, basically tied um, think tanks in Washington, ones that live almost exclusively off Pentagon contracts, to do the research again and publish the results. So we could get it out to the officer corps, but it can't come from the general staff, jo Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and those documents began to appear in about 2000, late 2007, early 2008. So um, I went back to London, where I live, and um, began inquiring if the British Army was up to the same sort of thing, and by God, it was. Um, in fact, I then picked up a very interesting phrase, which I'd never heard before, Lifeboat Britain. And Lifeboat Britain, it turned out, was a scenario where Europe is submerging under floods of climate refugees from less fortunate places, but Britain's pulled the, draw, the, the drawbridge up, the, the English Channel is keeping them out, and it's just barely managing to feed its own people, but there's no room aboard this lifeboat for any more. Lifeboat Britain. I get around to most of the major capitals every 12 or 18 months, and so I just put it on my list of things, inter people to interview, you know, we better talk to a couple of climate scientists there and a couple of generals serving, if possible, recently retired. If not, they're desperate for attention once they... <laughs> and, uh, you know, talk to Stanley McChrystal next week and see what you get. <laughs> and <laughs> and, um, and uh, so, you know, Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo, New Delhi, so on. And they're all thinking about it, all very quietly, but they're all studying what, in their particular geographic and strategic situation, global warming is going to do to their security and what the roles of their military are going to be. So, so you know, okay, this is serious. I better devote some more time to it, and I did. Hence the book, which you mustn't forget. And um, uh, here is basically what I found. And uh, the first thing I discovered um, is not specifically military, but it's very serious stuff. You may or may not have noticed, but um, almost exactly a year ago, uh, July of 2009, when they were holding that G8, G20 summit in Italy, the one that they're holding in Toronto this year, um, all of the great powers showed up and agreed that they would never allow the warming to pass the level of two degrees Celsius, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, ever. Now, of course, they didn't come up with a plan for how to stop it. That would be asking too much. 
But they actually did all agree, United States included, um, that that was the threshold we would never cross. They didn't tell us why, interestingly, but I think that's one more case of governments not wanting to say too much in front of the children lest you scare them. Um, what that was about was the point of no return. There is a point of no return, and that's it. Um, the basically, until about, you know, um, if you'll pardon me, I'll go on flipping back and forth between, between Celsius and Fahrenheit because I tend to think in Celsius, but I will translate. Um, the, the, the two degree Celsius, three and a half degree Fahrenheit threshold is chosen because beyond that much warming, we lose control. We can no longer shut it down. You see, at the moment, we are in control of the warming since it's our emissions of greenhouse gases that cause the warming. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. We get 80% of our energy as a civilization out of burning coal, oil, and gas, so it's not going to be easy to stop and switch, but it could be done. And if it were, we'd have turned off the emissions and the warming would stop. Not right away, but about 20 years later, there's a lag. Whereas, if we go past two, slash three and a half, um, what happens is that the heat itself, the additional heat in the system, causes natural feedbacks to kick in, natural emissions of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases, which we can't turn off. The permafrost starts to melt, the frozen ground around the pole, and there's enough methane and carbon dioxide locked up in that that it would double the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere if it all came out. The oceans warm up enough that they can no longer contain all the dissolved carbon dioxide they absorbed in previous eons, and so they start giving some of it back to the atmosphere. You know, it's rather like the warm beer principle. Warm beer goes flat, so do warm oceans. They lose their carbon dioxide, and it goes back into the atmosphere. Now, these are warming factors we can't control. So if we trigger them, we may find ourselves trapped on an escalator that's carrying us inexorably upwards through four, five, six degrees Celsius, do the translation. Uh, and um, that's not a good place to be. The world has been there before, not in human times, um, but the world has been six degrees Celsius, you know, 10 degrees Fahrenheit hotter in the past average global temperature, and when it was, there was very little land with, with plants growing on it south of about mid-Canada. The, the interior of all the continents was desert. And such a world would only support about a half a billion human beings in terms of how much land have we got left that we can grow stuff on. So you don't want to go there on the whole. Point of no return. That's what sets the threshold. But nobody mentioned that. They just set the threshold, you know. Don't, don't talk about this in front of the children. Um, everybody, by the way, the 192 countries adopted this when they had that enormous disaster of a meeting in uh, Copenhagen in December. It was a train wreck, but they did get one thing settled. Now 192 countries have adopted that target. They're still, you know, controversy in the blogs about this, but there isn't a serious government on the planet that has not actually accepted the scientific evidence. Okay. How does this create jobs for the military? I'm not being cynical. The military actually are tasked with the responsibility of detecting emerging threats to the security of the country they work for, and if that should by chance in create some more jobs for them. Well, they will accept it reluctantly. Um, but how does this do? I mean, why do we get conflicts? Why do we need soldiers just because it's getting warmer? And the answer is that the principal impact of warming on human civilization is on the food supply. The rule of thumb that the scientists apply 
is that you lose 10% of, of world food production, world grain production to be precise, for every one degree Celsius, one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, higher average global temperature. And we don't have any food production to spare. I mean, we have, we have accomplished a kind of miracle of the loaves and fishes over the last 60 years. The population of the world has tripled since the Second World War. We didn't discover any more land, and yet we are still feeding everybody, pretty much everybody. In fact, most of them are eating better than people ate in 1945. We have managed to get three times as much food off the same land. It is very impressive. I mean, you've heard about the Green Revolution. It wasn't actually all that green. Bits of it were. Um, we did come up with new strains of familiar plants that were higher yielding, more drought resistant, and so on. But we also put 10 times as much fertilizer on the land as we were using at the end of the Second World War, which is not exactly green. And we are irrigating three times as much land, although we didn't discover any new rivers after 1945 either. We're pumping it up from underground using large amounts of fossil fuel to do so, and the underground aquifers we're pumping don't, in most cases, refill anything like as fast as we're pumping them. In fact, many of them don't refill at all. So that's a temporary solution. But we kept up with the growing population in terms of food production until about 10 years ago. Uh, food production, grain production grew regularly 2 or 3% right through the, 40, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. But towards the end of the 90s, grain production flatlined. It's been basically flat now for about 10 years. And the population didn't stop growing. So we are actually beginning to eat into the global grain reserve to keep things on the road even now. Ten years ago, the global grain reserve was 150 days worth of eating for everybody on the planet. It's not a heap of grain somewhere. It's the sort of the arithmetic sum of all the grain that's still sitting in silos and bins or at sea in ships. At the end of the northern summer, northern hemisphere summer, just before the big northern hemisphere harvest comes in. So that's what you carried over from last year. That's your grain reserve. 150 days eating for everybody on the planet. This is the key measure of the security of a civilization. Has been for 5,000 years. Do you have enough to get you through to the next harvest? And that was fine until about 10 years ago. We're down to 57 days this year. So what we're doing is making up that shortfall by eating into the grain reserve. We can't afford to have any food production taken out of the system, and that's what's going to happen. With warming, we're going to lose significant amounts of grain production, and this will give the soldiers lots of jobs. Hungry people are not reasonable people, or at least with their definition of reasonable changes. The soldiers look at this and they see three sources of problems that they will be asked to deal with. And the first is waves of climate refugees, people who can no longer feed their families where they are now. It's gone too dry. It's gone too hot. They're not getting the crops off the fields anymore. Their government can't import food because it's happening in too many places at once. And even if they have money, there's no grain for sale anymore. We've got a global shortfall. And so they move. Nobody's going to sit there and, you know, by the side of the road and watch their children die, or at least most people aren't. And they will move, in the most cases, towards places that still have food. And the problem is that uh, the places that are going to be short of food are mostly nearer the equator, tropics and subtropics. The places that will still have food, happy days, are the countries that are responsible for the problem because we've been emitting carbon dioxide for 200 years. They're the countries further away from the equator in the higher latitudes, United States and Canada, uh, European countries, Russia, Japan, Australia, so on. 
So there's going to be a certain amount of resentment at what we imposed upon them, and there's going to be desperation, and they're going to want to come, and we are actually almost certainly going to have to stop them because we can't take everybody on board. Lifeboat America is not a phrase I've heard, but I think you might one day hear it. And so the soldiers see themselves holding the borders shut. I, when I was talking to people in a subsequent visit to Washington, um, one officer said to me, quite a senior officer who had been involved in the planning, though he'd moved on, he said, um, we're pretty well convinced in the Joint Chiefs, quite, you know, but don't quote me, um, that uh, Congress is going to order us to close the Mexican border for real within the next 10 to 15 years. That is to say, drop the present system of nod and a wink, catch some, let some go. Um, you know, we, American farmers need cheap stoop labor, and it's only cheap if it's illegal, so let some of them filter through. Um, a safety valve for Mexico. Um, that's going to stop. Because the American public, as the numbers coming across grow, will demand that the border be shut, and we will be given the job, and of course we will do it. We will do it with the means that we have at our disposal, which is defenses, of course, you know, fences and all the rest of it. But we know, everybody knows, that if you really want to shut a border, you have to be willing to kill people. Dirty little secret, but one that soldiers know. Um, if you don't, if you're not willing to kill people, they'll keep coming through. This is a long border. So, we'll do that. I mean, of course. But that's not just ugly in itself. This officer went on to say to me, um, I really don't like this scenario that I'm drawing for you because um, by the time we have to do this, close the border with the, between the United States and Mexico, we are going to have something around 20% of our own population of Hispanic origin. Most of them legally here, citizens and so on, but you know, within the last generation or so, they are from Mexico or Central America, and that's who we're killing on the border. He said, I think this could cause the gravest social divisions in the United States since the Civil War. So that's one category of problem, the refugees. And of course, the Europeans are looking at the same thing, except it's coming up out of Africa and coming out of the Middle East. They already have such a, an issue with the sort of boats trying to cross the Mediterranean, the boats coming out of West Africa trying to get to the Canary Islands, which is part of Spain, many of them foundering along the way because they've got 10 times as many people aboard as they should have and they leak and they're, you know, the fishermen only sold them because they weren't seaworthy anymore. And uh, that will grow and the defenses will get fiercer and people will start to die. South Africa's got the same problem, people coming from the north. The Australians have just finished about doubling the size of their navy because they see people coming out of in Indonesia and the Philippines south into the northern bits of Australia. There's already a flow, but it will grow. And the Russians, of course, are always paranoid about the Chinese, but now they're very paranoid because they're convinced um, that there will be huge numbers of Chinese refugees heading north into a Siberia which in the warmer climate of the future will actually be even more productive of grain than it is now. High enough in latitude that it actually benefits from global warming, one of the few places that does. Canada, Scandinavia, Russia. So that's the first category of problem. The second category of problem is failed states. A government that cannot feed its people doesn't survive. I think that's a reasonably straightforward rule of geopolitics. Job one, any government, keep your population alive. And if you fail in that, you don't have any credibility left. This is, by the way, what happened in Somalia in the early 90s. It's exactly how Somalia became a failed state. There was a famine. 
and nobody could deal with it, nobody did deal with it, and so it all broke down into fighting clans, and we're still at it 20 years later. Well, that's one failed state, and it's really the only full, fully fledged failed state we've got. Yemen may be going in that direction, but it's not there yet. How would you like a world with 20 states like that? Because that's what they see, principally in Africa and the Middle East. Um, where the populations are still growing fast and the resources are very, very slim indeed, and where the warming will be atrocious because that is part of the subtropics and the subtropics get hammered by climate change. The tropics and the subtropics get hammered by climate change, whereas the temperate zone like our own, much less so. At least in the early phases of warming. Later, everybody gets hammered, but we'll all be safely dead by then. I planned it that way. So, that's the scenario the military see, but with one further source of war, of, of military, or reason for military involvement, which is actual wars. Um, it's actually not that easy to envisage cross-border wars as a result of hunger. Refugees, yes, failed state, yes, but in most cases not war, but in the case of countries that have to share the same river system, yes. Because in, when there's not enough water to go around for all of the countries that depend on that river's water, the upstream country will face an overwhelming temptation to keep the water for itself. So that means the downstream state starts to starve. I think that Iraq would actually be at war with Turkey this year if Iraq were not a wreck, flat on its back, incapable of fighting a war with Luxembourg, let alone Turkey. Because um, the Turks control the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which are the lifeblood of Iraq. I mean, central and southern Iraq, it doesn't rain at all. The only source of water is those rivers. It, you know, in 5,000 years of agriculture in Mesopotamia, as it used to be, it's only rained 5,000 days. All the water comes down those rivers, but the Turks have built 12 big dams on the headwaters of those rivers. They're filling the reservoirs, they're developing new irrigated land up there, and this year, there's no water in the Euphrates at all. It doesn't reach the junction with the Tigris anymore, and agriculture has essentially shut down in western Iraq. Now, that's okay at the moment, because there's still lots of grain available on the global grain market, and Iraq does have oil money, so there's nobody starving. But if Iraq were back on its feet, I think there'd be a war. And you can make similar comments for Egypt versus the states upstream on the Nile. You can certainly make them for the countries of Southeast Asia and the Mekong versus, in, versus China, which is already build, building dams on the headwaters there. And above all, you can make it for India and Pakistan, which is kind of a, ugly because both of those countries have nuclear weapons. Pakistan lives entirely by the waters of the Indus River. 85% of Pakistan's food is farmed, on, grown on land, irrigated from the Indus River or its six trib tributaries. And we're talking about 170 million people now, maybe 250 million in 20 years' time. That's the only source of water. Yeah, Pakistan is basically semi-desert, you know, and if it weren't for that river, it, well, it is a bit like Egypt at three times the scale, frankly. Nothing but the river to depend. Now, the problem is, first, all of those tributaries, like almost all of the rivers of South and East Asia, start in glaciers up on the Tibetan Plateau. And the glaciers are melting. They're going quite fast. The Chinese Academy of Sciences says that they're losing mass on average of 7% a year, which means they're losing half their mass in 10 years and three quarters in 20. So you can look forward to, you know, 20 years of flooding followed by no water in the river in the summertime because it doesn't rain up there in the summertime. What keeps the water in the river in the summertime now 
is that the glaciers build up their mass in the winters and then they build they melt back down in the summer and that keeps the rivers flowing in the summer when you want the water. Um, so about 20 years from now, 25 years from now, there's not going to be enough to go around. Now the problem that makes this a source of war is that five of the six tributaries of the Indus River have to cross Indian controlled territory before they reach Pakistan. And there's a treaty signed 50 years ago which says India can take this fixed volume of water out and the rest flows through to Pakistan and the rest is about 70%. So Pakistan gets most of the water. But if the river's only half full, India can still take the same amount out. The treaty doesn't say India only gets a 30% share. The treaty says India gets, <laughs> I get carried away sometimes, you know it is. India only gets, you know, India gets this much water, and if that much water is now 80% of what's in the river, it still takes. And I can't imagine an Indian government saying, oh, shucks, this is not fair. Let's give the PACs more water. But the PACs are starting to starve. So there are situations where you could get a war, even a nuclear war, out of that. And the armies look at that, too. I know the, that both the Pakistani and the Indian general staffs are looking at this problem. I mean, they know it's not today's problem, but it is potentially tomorrow's killer. The, the headline on all this is that we have not just got a physical deadline a point of no return. We know what that is, it's two degrees. Celsius, three and a half Fahrenheit. We also have, you might say, a political deadline because as we go into the warming and the refugees start to move and the failed states multiply and the wars break out, we lose the capacity to make that global deal which would ever allow us to get our emissions under control. You need a relatively peaceful and cooperative world in order to make this in extraordinarily complicated and lopsided deal that we've got to make, the one they were trying to make in Copenhagen last December. If you are going to negotiate that deal, you'd better, not be, on, you'd better be on speaking terms with everybody. And we have such a world now. We live in an extraordinary peaceful world. I know there's a little war going on here and there, but, you know, there were dozens of days in the First or Second World Wars when the United States lost as many soldiers as it's lost in, in Afghanistan in, t in nine years. It's, it's not big. So, you know, we have this peaceful world where we have the institutions that we can all sit down together and negotiate in, but we're going to lose it if we let this go on too far. The warming itself, long before it triggers the, uh, the runaway effect, long before we pass the physical deadline, will produce the kind of social breakdown, political breakdown, that will make it harder and harder to make the deal. What else can I tell you? I can tell you this. We could fix this. I mean, the technologies do exist to replace the gas and oil, well, the gas and the coal we burn, and we're getting pretty close to being able to reduce the oil as well, uh, to, to replace the oil as well. Not necessarily quite as cheaply, but we're not talking two or three times more expensively. We have the renewables, the uh, solar and the wind and so on, tidal power as well if you happen to have a seacoast handy or wave power. Um, but we have nuclear, you can argue about it, but it, isn't, it, it doesn't produce carbon dioxide. It's uh, relatively clean from that aspect. And we have even the promise of geothermal power. So there are ways to replace it and the time constraints are not impossible. If we started now and replaced it at oh, let's say two or three percent a year, we'd be out of fossil fuels in 40 years, 30 years. And that would probably do the trick. But I don't know anybody in the business, either the scientific business or the military business or the political business, who really in their hearts of, heart of hearts thinks we're going to make that deadline. <laughs>
I'm, I would prefer not to say this, but it is my observation after talking to some hundreds of people who are in a position to know that none of them really think we're going to stop before we hit 450 parts per million. 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent is what will produce that two degrees Celsius, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit threshold. Won't happen right away. You'll go to, through 450 and it'll be another 20 years before you're really experiencing, or 15 years or 10, but it's too late to turn back once you've gone through 450. I don't know anybody who thinks we can stop it. We're at 390 now. We've come out, it was 280 at the beginning of this, the uh, Industrial Revolution, what, 200 years ago. It's 390 now and we've only got to get to 450 and we busted through the, the, the threshold. And of course there's far more people trying to live in industrial societies now than there were back then. We're moving, we are actually covering that distance at the rate of three parts per million a year. That's how much the concentration in the atmosphere was rising per year until we hit this recession. And it will resume once we emerge from the recession. In fact, it's not really dropped all that much because so much of it was coming out of Asia, which really hasn't had a recession. So that's, you know, 20 years and you're, you're done. I don't think we're turning the super tanker around in 20 years. We just lost two more years. I mean, they're not going to get back to the, the, the table they were sitting around in Copenhagen, I'm sure, until sometime late next year. Which is why the scientists who, two years ago even, would not publicly discuss the whole issue of geoengineering. It was under an absolute taboo. You'd be... I, I, isolated by your fellow scientists if you talked about it in public. Now they're talking about it because it's their only get out of jail card that they can see. Geoengineering is ways of holding the temperature down even when the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere means it's going to go up. It's a way to cheat. And there are a number of techniques um, on the table now, and they're in public. The scientists are sufficiently scared they are talking about it now. Um, on the table as possible ways of avoiding going through 2 degrees Celsius, even though we have gone through 450 parts per million. Because we're going to. We're probably going to hit 500. I wouldn't be surprised if we hit 550. It's just, we'll do it in the end. But it's like Winston Churchill once. I love quoting, everybody quotes Winston Churchill, right? He said this about Americans, but it's not fair. It applies to the whole human race. He said, they always do the right thing in the end. After they've exhausted all of the alternatives. <laughs> and that's us. I mean, we will do the right thing in the end, but we'll be a day late and a dollar short, and it will actually be a bit past 450, and you don't want to reap the whirlwind here, so can we cheat, please? And uh, the cheating is geoengineering. I'll just give you a little taster of, of, of the kinds of techniques that are being discussed. The, the, the guy who actually finally let the cat out of the bag was a man called Paul Crutzen. Now that's almost three years ago now. He wrote a famous, now famous article in one of the major scientific journals in which he said, look, we're going to bust through 450 parts per million. Let's be realistic. What can we do about it? I propose that what we do is to mimic the action of large volcanoes, which when they explode, put very large amounts of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. Now, we put very large amounts of sulfur dioxide into the troposphere, the lower atmosphere. That's, you know, industry does that. But it all rains out after a week or two because there's a lot of weather in the lower. Well, you know a bit about rain here, don't you? <laughs> and, um, but when the big volcanoes blow, they put it in the, in the stratosphere. The stratosphere, but, you know, where the airplanes fly above 27,000 feet, there is no weather. So if you get the particles up there, it doesn't rain out. It stays for a long time. 
And those particles of sulfur dioxide turn into tiny droplets of sulfuric acid which reflect sunshine. Enough sunshine that you actually get a pronounced cooling effect around the planet. There's a little bit less sunlight reaching the surface. When Mount Pinatubo blew in, I think, 1991, the big Philippines volcano, the last big one to blow, um, the whole planet was, two, was a half a degree Celsius, a degree Fahrenheit cooler for the next two years. So we could do that. We could put sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere in modest amounts, nothing like the amount we dump into the lower atmosphere all the time, but, uh, but it'll stay and it will provide us with a kind of sunshade. Solar radiation management is the key word, SRM, you're going to he be hearing about it. And, you know, it doesn't produce darkness at noon. The crops still grow like they always did, but it does reduce the incoming sunlight enough that you get a cooling effect. Now, Paul Crutzen is a Nobel Prize winner, and he got, he's an atmospheric chemist who got his Nobel Prize for work on the ozone hole. So he does know what he's talking about. He wants to see a lot more experiments done on this. He doesn't want to suddenly jump in and do it for the whole world, but he, he thinks it would probably be all right, because after all, volcanoes do this, and we're all still here. And it did produce the warming. So, you know, intuitively, it probably will work, but let's experiment a bit and make sure there's no really nasty side effects. We don't have a guarantee here, but that's something we should be looking at. Second one is... Uh, thickening up the clouds near the surface of the earth. There's a, a, a layer, of co uh, it's called marine stratocumulus cloud, a layer, I, I used to be in various navies, and I was under this stuff a lot of the time. It covers about a quarter of the world's oceans. It's only, oh, two, three hundred feet up quite often, almost like ground fog above your head, very thin. You can often see blue sky through it, but it does reflect a lot of incoming sunlight. And the idea is, well, we could just spray some fine mist of seawater up and it'll ca get carried up into the clouds by turbulence and thicken them up. And they'll reflect a little bit more of the incoming sunlight and produce a significant cooling factor on a global scale. The idea is you build, you know, little fleets of uh, 50 or 100 robot vessels, remote-controlled, wind-powered, satellite-directed, and they just position themselves under the, uh, under the cloud and spray seawater, mist, into the air. All driven by sail. You're not. You don't need. You're not using fuel. You know, promising. Last one. I like this one. Uh, there's a friend of mine who works for NASA. He's actually the chief scientist of the Langley Research Facility, and he emailed me last Christmas. He said, uh, "Guess what? I crunched the numbers. We could lower the average global temperature by one whole degree Celsius if we just painted all the roofs and the roads white." I mean, you know, a quick and dirty solution to a quick and unexpected problem, one time only. Um, and you'd need sunglasses whenever you drove, but, you know. <laughs> okay, here's the downside, by the way, of all of this, which is that all of these methods are relatively cheap. And that means almost any government can do them, not just enormously rich and powerful governments like the American or the Russian or the Chinese. The Bangladeshis could do this. And they're likely to want to do it before we do. Because, you know, they're up to their knees in water and starving at the same time. They want to turn the heat down. And they're not going to wait till we're ready. So there, there is actually a potential source of conflict even in this get out of jail free card. So there is the problem. Um, I think that the only thing <laughs> remains to say is that bizarrely, or perhaps not bizarrely, understanding often helps, I'm actually a little bit more optimistic than I was when I started this trip through the climate change world. Because I can see a way through the woods. It doesn't mean we won't get lost or eaten by a bear, but there is a path that goes through the woods. And uh, there are even a couple of second chances if you make a mess the first time. So, um, you know, we'll 
we and our children will spend our lives dealing with this one, but uh, there's a reasonable chance that we'll come out the other end without the catastrophe of losing half the population of the planet, which is the penalty for really getting it wrong. Thank you very much. Could you comment in terms of the scenario that you're, um, you've depicted in terms of deltas? and the sea rises that would uh, affect, I think, fairly large populations, yeah. uh, even, even in a very mild kind of change. Deltas are where we raise a great deal, river deltas are where we raise a great deal of the world's food. Um, the proportion I'm not, in, in the case of China, it's probably 20%, for example. In the big east-facing river deltas, low-lying land with the sea level rising and the, the, to the cyclones roaring in from the Pacific every, every hurricane season, cyclone season, um, you could get the, uh, the river f flooded all the way up, for example, from the delta to Shanghai, 40 kilometers to the west, with just, you know, the wrong combination of another 15 years of sea level rise, a spring tide, and a big, volc a big cyclone coming in at the wrong time, wrong, wrong, wrong week of the month. Um, that's, those, are, those are very vulnerable areas. The Nile Delta is extremely vulnerable. Um, and actually, the big U.S. deltas, well, not exactly deltas, but low-lying land along the East Coast is very vulnerable, too. Um, Chesapeake Bay is a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, it's funnel-shaped, and you get the, you know, again, the spring tide and the hurricane coming in, um, and give us, let's say, half a, half a meter, two feet of sea level rise, which we'll have by the middle of the century or before. And, uh, you know, Washington, downtown Washington's underwater. You lose half the farmland around Chesapeake Bay, three states. So uh, it's a big problem, uh, but for specific countries, America faces a fairly large problem, China, China faces a huge problem, India faces a big problem, they've got a lot of low-lying deltas as well, all of Southeast Asia, and uh, of course Egypt, um, whereas, you know, on the other hand, Switzerland doesn't have this problem. Uh, I've been uh, much more familiar with your political writings, and uh, so it was fascinating to hear you talk about climate. Uh, however, I was a little embarrassed by your throwaway line on, on the little wars you said, because you only counted our debts and you didn't count the half a million Iraqis and the others. So a lot of people have died, not just the little wars where we, 76 of our troops have died. That, uh, however, my question is also as a Bangladeshi... Well, let me apologize for that first, because you're quite right. Go ahead. Okay, as a Bangladeshi, I'm not, we are not starving yet, no. though you're right, we are going underwater slowly. Uh, would you comment on the Faraka Barrage and the other dams that India is building? And uh, will this expedite the problem and make it come a little sooner? I think that the, you know, the, the Indians are looking after themselves, as you would expect them to do, and the barrages that they're building before those rivers reach Bangladesh will, of course, be a problem for Bangladesh. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of weird that you can be desperately short of fresh water when you've got all the salt water you could possibly want up around your knees, but that's the way fate is, you know. Um, yeah, it's a problem. I had a very interesting conversation um, with the head of the Bangladeshi, Bangladesh Institute for Strategic Studies. You may not even have known such a thing existed, but it does. And uh, so I spoke to General Munir Zaman, who's the, the head of it, and we were talking about these issues, and basically he can see conflict everywhere he looks. And as you know, India has just about finished building a three-meter-high fence all the way around Bangladesh, anticipating the refugees to come. Yes. I uh, would assume that uh, there are basically three responses when people hear uh, the message that you are uh, delivering. One is, you're right, we need to do something about it. One is, well, maybe you're right, but um, you know, there's nothing we can do. We just have to see what happens. And then you'll get the people who react very badly and probably address you with ad hominem comments of one kind or another. 
And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that third group, because I suspect you probably have run into it. You probably <laughs> have met those folks. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about who they are and the kind of perhaps what motivates them and how we, will de we should deal with them, because we're going to have to actually have them come along in order to actually get anything done. It's very difficult, um, and I feel not tremendously qualified to answer your question because, of course, I'm not American, and it is predominantly an American problem. This level of disbelief and highly politicized disbelief is not very common elsewhere. I mean, the debate, as such as it ever was, has been over long ago outside the English-speaking world. I mean, you know, the Germans don't have this debate going on, or the Japanese or the Russians or whatever, you know. The, of course, that's the science. Get on with it. Um, whereas here, it's become an ideological badge. And uh, so, you know, we're talking almost uh, quite specifically about American politics and American ideas, although if you went to Canada or Australia or Britain, you'd find some traces of it because it flops over. But beyond that, you don't. <laughs> That's quite right, yes, and, and frankly, the Prime Minister of Canada is a secret climate change denier to this day, though he's, like Mr. Bush, learned to curve his tongue in public, um, rather late in the day. Um, but um, here, and by extension in those other English-speaking countries, saving New Zealand, who are always out of step, um, good thing too, um, the, the problem is that it has become a badge of allegiance. In other words, I am one of our club because I am against abortion and I don't believe in climate change and tick, tick, tick. It's, it's one of those badges rather than I don't believe in climate change because the science is wrong or it's not really getting warmer or so on. I mean, that you could argue with in a rational way, but you can't argue with them being members of that club. Um, why it went that way, I still don't know. Because if you think about it, um, being on the right politically doesn't make people disbelievers elsewhere. Margaret Thatcher, also known as Attila the Hen, <laughs> not a person whose, whose left-wing proclivities were widely recognized, um, was the person who actually founded and opened the Hadley Center on Climate Change Research, which is probably the premier institution in the world for doing that in southwestern England. Um, the current German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, who is a woman of the right, certainly takes point for the European Union on climate change matters. So elsewhere, it's not that way. And, you know, why did it become? I don't know why it became, but it is a, an ideological badge here. And that makes it extraordinarily difficult to have a rational conversation about it. You're talking about loyalty here and identity, not about facts. You see, that's, I can describe the problem, but I cannot tell you how to fix it. And it's really difficult um, because we depend upon the United States to lead, or at least to get in step. <laughs> and, you know... <laughs> And it's very difficult. I mean, the principal reason why the, 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 the Copenhagen conference fell apart was that Mr. Obama had to go to Denmark with no American commitment, legal commitment, to do anything about U.S. emissions because it hadn't even reached the floor of the Senate. Um, the Chinese weren't going to make some commitment of their own when the United States still hadn't done so. And so it all, after that, it all sort of cascaded and, and, and collapsed. But uh, we do need the United States to do this, and neither I nor many people I've spoken to know how to get, get round it. Because as, you know, I mean, the culture wars have been raging for 20 years, and frankly, the country manages to divide very neatly, almost straight down the middle. I mean, if Mr. Obama only won 53% of the vote. You know, it wasn't a landslide. Given the increased melting rate of glaciers already, I wondered if maybe it would be a good idea for people to start looking into this um, geoengineering sooner rather than later. And I don't understand why 
the U.S. would want to wait and, you know, because we have melting glaciers too. It's, you know, when they might be more seriously looking on this? It's, it's, um, it's a good question. Um, I would like it to, to see it happen sooner. I don't, first of all, we actually have not got a, a cast iron guarantee that two degrees Celsius is the right threshold. It could be lower. Um, and secondly, uh, as you say, you know, bad things, including glaciers melting, happen before you get to two degrees. I think some of the famines happen before you get to two degrees. And uh, so uh, we should be testing and experimenting on an open air basis, like now. And if it shows promise, it doesn't do any, doesn't have really noxious side effects, we should be starting to use some of the, deploy some of these ways of keeping the temperature down soon. What does soon mean? Tim Flannery, who's the leading Australian climate scientist, says he thinks we will be doing it within five years. Um, I don't think we will, but I think perhaps we should be. Yes, because it seems like once glaciers start melting, we may never get them back. And well, so exactly. We I mean, there are, there, there, there are points of no return, and we don't know quite where they are. Some of them we don't know of. Uh, but, you know, the, this is not, none of these processes are linear. And they're all nonlinear. All, almost all natural processes are nonlinear. It's, it, you know, you can push this system quite hard for quite a long time and it remains stable and then suddenly it flips. That's what happens in nature. And uh, we're pushing an awful lot of systems quite hard. One of the things they discuss uh, in terms of geoengineering, uh, one of the problems that some people see is that it helps us cope with a higher temperature. But one of the consequences is it doesn't really decrease CO2 present in the atmosphere, and, it, and particularly what it doesn't seem to deal with is ocean acidification. None. No, you're absolutely you, right. I don't know if they've discussed that. In terms oh, of they discuss it endlessly. I mean, they, 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 yeah. the, the, one of the reasons they didn't want to talk about this in public was that they realized that the temptation would be that we would simply control the temperature and not address the issue of carbon dioxide emissions. Well, if we do that, in the long run, we're screwed. Um, because, as you say, all it does is hold the heat down. Now, holding the heat down holds at bay, please God, the feedbacks, so you don't get into runaway. Uh, but you use that time to get your emissions down. You're stealing time. That's all any of the people I know who are advocating or researching um, geoengineering techniques are, are, are really interested in is we don't have enough time. We're going to go through 450. Give me another 20 years. Please, God, here it is. You know, and um, and meanwhile, you lose the North Pacific. It's going to be the first ocean to go from acidification. North Pacific may not have 20 years left. So, I mean, I'm, this is not it's not really a get out of jail free card. But it's a commutation of the sentence. We seem to mostly hear about the problem being the flooding that's going to result from seas rising and which results from glaciers, particularly in Antarctica and Greenland. And so I'd like to be more clear what you think about That's that problem versus the, the starvation problem versus the water problem. The, 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 the sea level rise is the last big thing to hit us. And so th there's, um, and almost all the sea level rise we are experiencing at the moment is not due to glaciers melting, it's due to the fact that as the water in the oceans gets warmer, it expands. Um, and so uh, we're looking at, I was in the Netherlands recently because there's a Dutch version of the book coming out and they said, could you write a, you know, scenario about the Netherlands? And I thought, oh God, I don't know anything about, the, you know, I've never been anywhere except um, Amsterdam and that was a drug sodden haze. So, <laughs> um, you know, so, so, so I went. To Amsterdam, to, to, the, to the Netherlands for two or three days and, and interviewed a lot of people, including, of course, all the people who were working on the, the dikes because, you know, 30% of the countries underwater is, is below sea level now and it'll be 70% by the time you get another meter, meter of sea level rise. Turns out they're not using the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as rather modest 20th cent, 21st century prediction, maybe half a meter by the end of the century. Nope. 
They're going two-thirds of a meter to a meter and a half by the end of the century. A meter and a half is just slight, it's about this height. <laughs> you know? So, um, <laughs> and, um, and they are, they are, you know, sort of strengthening their dikes and seaward defenses to deal with that. But even then, you're talking about end of the century. Um, the other effects hit much faster. The, 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 the loss of rain, the, 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 the big things that hit the food supply is in the tropics, it just gets too hot. Most of the food crops grown in the tropics were domesticated further away from the equator in cooler temperatures and they're right at the top of their temperature tolerance range in the tropics. Give it two extra degrees, they're gone. And in the subtropics, it stops raining. And uh, those things happen much faster than the sea level rise. Um, acidification of the oceans happens much faster than sea level rise. We are getting into the danger zone now. Uh, in the long run, if you lose all the ice on the planet, you get 70 meters of sea level rise, which is about 200 feet, in fact, 250 feet. Um, but that doesn't happen for some hundreds of years because it takes a long time for all the ice to melt. A local writer, Peter Ward, is apparently, I know his books. Has apparently yep. been saying yep. it's inevitable uh, already. Um, I, I, this is his most recent book, which I haven't read. I read yeah, Under yeah. a Green Sky. At least the, the cover indicates yeah, it's yeah, inevitable. I, I've seen it in the shops yeah. and I haven't bought it yet. Um, I don't know why he said that because I haven't read the book yet. Um, but I do talk to particularly Jim Hansen, who's, who's very good on, on ancient climates. Um, he's been working in that field for about five or six years now because he realized, you know, if you really want to know what happens when the temperature changes, your one, si you know, your, your one piece of evidence is what happened when the temperature did go that way last time. And so he's go gone into paleoclimate and taken a lot of people with him. And uh, he has not said... Uh, that we are at that point yet, that where, you know, it's too late, you're going to lose all the ice on the planet. Um, he's launched this 350.org um, uh, movement, which I think is a very sense. We're prop 450 is the number where, you know, you, you're, you're going into runaway warming right away, but over the long run, his argument is 350 parts per million, leave it there long enough, you lose all the ice on the planet. So you, got, you can't just sort of stop at 450 and hold. That's, that's the first thing to do, and, or, but then you've got to get it back down. Um, so uh, does that mean we lose all the ice? No, not necessarily, but maybe Peter Ward knows something I don't. I mean, I'm not, I'm not being snarky there. He may do. I, I haven't read that book.